You're tuned into One World Music on KZFR 90.1 FM. And I have in the studio now my guest, Harry Krasakis. Herbalists and Herbs is the home of Harry Krasakis, a medical herbalist. Although Harry is a trained herbalist, the application of natural medicine is wider, including herbs, supplements, nutraceuticals, diet, <laughs> nutritional agents, mild forms of exercise and therapy, water therapy, and if necessary, therapeutic body work. Harry Krasakis's approach to natural healing involves, from his website, the use of multiple non-toxic modalities to elicit change and healing. Based on the principles of the following of following the laws of the body, supporting its strengths and self-correcting nature and doing no harm. Harry resides in the Grass Valley area but makes regular presentations in the Chico area. Welcome. Thank you, Diane. Because your natural healing information is vast, we decided to narrow the subject down today. And so please introduce what you decided you wanted to share during this winter season. Yes, the uh, subject that came to is adaptogenic herbs for health and healing. And um, what I wanted to do was first cover the history and traditional application of the herbs, then go into more modern research and the wider application of them. <coughs> Excuse me. And then go into a couple of herb monographs as well about individual herbs. So um, if you look at all the major pharmacopoeias in the, on the planet, traditional ones, that is Chinese, Tibetan, Yunani, Tib, Ayurvedic, they all have a tonic class of herbs in their pharmacopoeias. And at the top of those tonics, you'll see all the adaptogenic herbs. So although all adaptogens are tonics, not all tonics are adaptogens, and there's a reason for that in, built into the definition. And I'll go into that a little later. But uh, once again, these, these herbs are for long-term use. They have wide application. They have deep effect. And uh, once again, they have a long history of human use. Now, in terms of getting to the, uh, the definition of adaptogen, the, the modern research was done between 1947 and 1962 in Russia because the Russian scientists were mandated by their government to find something that was non-toxic, non-addictive, and could produce more result in their elite, basically their soldiers, their astronauts, their athletes, their chess players. They wanted them to be able to produce more output with less fatigue. So the first thing that they looked into uh, that had a lot of information on it was uh, Panax ginseng or Chinese ginseng. And what they realized quickly was that it gave these elite group of, of people more ability in all the areas that they wanted. That is, they could go longer, harder, faster, with better recovery time. So they termed, they coined the term adaptogen because it gave the body the ability to adapt to any kind of stress. Wouldn't matter if it was hot or cold, food deprivation, long marches, hard mental problems, prolonged mental work. Um, so they once again, they gave it this term adaptogen because it gave the ability to cope with these kind of stresses. And then they set forth uh, a number of parameters that would determine which things were adaptogens. Now, worldwide, there's only about 30 of them, so it's a relatively limited thing. Um, the first thing was non-toxic. The second thing was uh, non-addictive. The third thing was normalizing. And the fourth thing, which is really kind of the clincher that really sets the definition, was that it had to raise nonspecific resistance. And what that means is that it has to give the body the ability to adapt to things as it comes at it. And these herbs actually do all that. If you look at um, the traditional applications of them, they don't, it seems a bit crazy because they can do things apparently in what would appear to be opposite directions. So if someone has high blood pressure, it'll bring it down normal. If they have low blood pressure, it'll bring it up to normal. Same thing with blood sugars. Um, you can go into 10 different areas like that, and it will, the adaptogenic herbs will exhibit these kind of dual property um, expressions. And that's a bit confusing for our Western mind, but um, 
if you look into what they do and how they do it, it will become clear why they get that kind of a result. Now, in the, in the West, our model is uh, physiologic and anatomic. And the two major controlling systems that deal with all information that's coming into the body and, going, and coming from the body is being synthesized by two things. Uh, the central nervous system with its sister, the autonomic nervous system, and the central hormonal axis. So basically the neural endocrine system is dealing with all this information and then adjusting things like blood pressure, blood volume, electrolyte levels, things like that. Things that give us the, abody, the ability of our body to continue to live under a variety of stressful circumstances and to come back to normal again. This is a really important thing. So. Um, when you look at those, those properties in the herbs and you're trying to figure out how can it do this thing, if you look at, once again, that they go into these kind of core controlling mechanisms in the body, that is, as at least as it's understood in Western science, um, that they actually go into where you might think the dials are for the different systems and adjust those dials so that you can get a very profound effect upon the body in a very deep way. So adaptogens in my approach, and I've been treating people with herbs for about 20 years, are core therapies. And I use them, the reason why I use the, the, uh, the, ch the, the title in health and healing is it's because they're both for prevention and for treatment. And I use them in both settings a lot. So when what the Russians found out was a limitation in terms of their research on Asian ginseng was that it didn't grow in Russia. So they wanted something that grew in their backyard. So uh, the first thing they began to look at that was local uh, was Eleutherococcus centococcus, which is Siberian ginseng. And then three other plants too, Schizandra, Rapunthicum, and Rhodiola, all of which are classic adaptogens now. But anyway, in their work with Eleutherococcus, the reason why they call it Siberian ginseng, because it's not a ginseng, it's of a different, completely different family. The Panaxes are small tap roots, but the Eleutherococcuses are big, bushy plants that grow in a very different environment as well. But it exhibited such similar qualities, similar qualities given to the body, the ability to adapt to stress, that they said, we'll call it Siberian ginseng. So they were so impressed with their results that they actually began to produce a product that's still for sale now in Russia at that time. So to give, uh, once again, that definition, which is real important, non-toxic, non-addictive, normalizing, and must raise non-specific resistance. The majority of these plants grow in China, Korea, Russia, and India. We have a couple that grow here, too, licorice and American ginseng. But the majority of that, th roughly 30 plants, are not indigenous to the U.S. Now, um, in terms of balancing the stress response, that's one of the things that it's do that it's really critical in terms of both keeping people's health and of also treating people with long-term disease because chronic diseases are very stressful on the body. They induce their own problems. But to give you some general uh, principles of adaptogens, all adaptogens are antioxidants. All adaptogens are anti-inflammatory. And in treating chronic disease, especially or modern chronic diseases, they all have an inflammatory and an oxidative damage component. So right away, the adaptogens have a place right there. The third thing is its big impact is on the immune system. Um, the immune system is contingent upon the functioning of those two central core um, controlling systems, which is the central nervous system and the central hormonal axis or the neural endocrine system. So if they are dysfunctional in how they are working, the immune system will follow. It will not respond correctly. And again, this is an important point that adaptogens do. They give the body the ability to go out and adapt to a stress, but then come back to recuperate and regenerate. Now, when people are under long-term stress, they go into a couple places. Either they burn out, they have adrenal burnout, in which case they become extremely dysfunctional and have a pretty uncomfortable life. Or the body learns to adjust to these massive amount of stress hormones that we're pumping into our bloodstreams, and eventually they die from some type of catastrophic event like a stroke or a heart attack. So the adaptogens can work in both areas, that is to build up people that are adrenally burned out and to balance people that are over-amped. Now, 
again, as a clinician, uh, I'm rarely using individual herbs. I'm always applying them in formulas. And, and the reason why is because I think they actually work better. But when I speak about the herbs, I will also speak about them individually and the amount of testing that's done on them individually. Now, if I were to compare an adaptogenic herb with, say, a regular treatment herb, we'll go into the Chinese pharmacopoeia. pharmacopoeia. They have superior herbs, inferior herbs, and then toxic herbs. That's kind of how they break it up in a general way. And uh, their superior herbs, as I mentioned before, at the top of them is their tonics. So if you're going to compare one of the adaptogenic herbs to, say, one of the, one of the, the uh, inferior herbs, which is in the more of their treatment class for short-term things, the um, inferior class or treatment herb would be like an herb delivering a book's worth of information to the cell because, in my opinion, herbs deliver information. They're messengers. So a normal herb would deliver, say, a book's worth of information. A adaptogenic herb would be delivering an encyclopedia. It would be that l much larger, deeper, wider in its effect. So why would you use? So why would you use the inferior? Herbs? Well, you have to use herbs to clear things too, and and there's a, a lot of herbs in, in the there's at least five thousand herbs in the Chinese pharmacopoeia, and for doing clearing work, for draining energies in the liver, for getting better bile function, there are herbs that are better than the adaptogens. But if you combine them together you get even a, a far greater effect. Sometimes in acute circumstances, you just need to forget the constitutional work and deal with the acute crisis that you're dealing with in the moment. And that's kind of how I work. I get rid of the problem, and then I go back to constitutional work. Mm -hmm. This way I can get a focused effect both on the problem that arose in an acute way and back to this constitutional therapy, which is for the longer term. Mm -hmm. um, now, just to give you some, again, some general things that adaptogens do, they slow down the aging process. They protect all of the systems in the body, including the organs, the brain, the liver, the lungs, the kidney, the heart. And again, there's a lot of information that's available on this. In the East, uh, in China, they have, um, they have a whole branch of herbal medicine called Fujian therapy that's dedicated to the use of tonics when people are undergoing chemo or radiation because they think it's ludicrous that you can give someone such strong, relatively toxic stuff and not back it up, try to strengthen the body. So they've been doing this for quite a while with a great deal of success in terms of uh, mitigating side effect, getting better quality of life and longer life from people that have very serious forms of cancer. Unfortunately, a lot of that information is not accepted in America because it's not based on double-blind, placebo-randomized studies. And for me, that's a severe shortcoming of our scientific method, which is also good but needs to be more inclusive of, of, of other people's ideas of what reality is. Because once again, when the Chinese do these kind of tests, uh, they actually do them on people. They don't, they don't do double-blind, placebo-randomized studies on mice or rabbits. They actually use the stuff on people and get results on people. So they have a valid amount of information. Now, when we get into dealing with the immune system, um, there's a number of things that have to stay intact for us to stay healthy. One is that the immune system must recognize a problem. Then it must neutralize or destroy the problem. Then it has to remember the problem, then it has to rest and recuperate. And this is a part that's kind of forgotten for Americans. Uh, and the rest and recuperative phase is a very big thing. Um, once again, if we don't come back, rest, rebuild, we can't go out on the next kind of stressful event and deal with it properly because we're running on half a tank. Um, again, you can see just by the amounts of things that these herbs can do, that they have a really wide application, both in terms of prevention and treatment. So just uh, interrupt you. So um, just what you were talking about, that would be like someone that had the flu, they almost are, are almost well, you know, they're depleted, but then they go ahead and go to work, and then they relapse. <laughs> it's pretty common. I mean, I really yeah. have to ingrain that into people. Often, uh, just to, as your example, if people have bad colds for a long period of time, uh, the tissue in whatever areas they're working with, their respiratory tract, gets degraded. Um, often, if they don't tone properly, 
they'll leave that area open for infection. This is why people get repeated bronchial infections, sinus infections. It's because the tissue never really healed properly. Um, a couple of the herbs I'm going to go into have specific effect. Like if I was going to deal with a, uh, a, an acute case of bronchitis, I would deal with a group of herbs that help clear and bring down the bronchitis. But when I was dealing with a chronic case, on, on, in between flare-ups, I'd be using reishi mushroom because it's an adaptogen that has a particular effect on rebuilding that area. And once again, you can see it's proof when you treat people properly, their attacks of things become less, less often, and less intense. Rishi is also great because it's anti-allergenic as well, and a lot of these things are brought on by initial allergic attacks. Now, again, as I mentioned, all these things that the immune system is supposed to do, the adaptogens make it do it better. They make them work better. Now, again, when I work in my practice and I'm working preventatively or in treatment, there's different applications to the same idea. So when I'm doing preventative work, it's much less frequent that people have to take things, say two to three times a day. And the dosages, the amounts of things in the dosages are much lower. Uh, when you're treating someone who's sick chronically, you're treating them four, five, six times a day. Um, your dosages are much higher. And the reason is that herbs half-life in about two hours. They're not like drugs, which half-life in four to six. So if you want to keep peak serum levels up, you have to overlap in terms of dosaging. Uh, also, the difference in treatment is when I'm treating people prophylactically or for preventatively, I don't have to use the absolute best quality and 50 or 100 to 1 extracts, which I do use on people that are chronically ill because I want to get as much impact on the disorder as, po as possible. What I mean by uh, 50 or 100 to 1 is that if I was to use the example of milk thistle. If I took an ounce of milk thistle and measured it against a 50 to 1 extract of milk thistle, the 50 to 1 extract would have 50 times more of the active ingredients. So it's substantially different. And because the type of therapy I, I dish out is oral, I mean, I, there's no intravenous work, you have to be very efficient in how you're working things and structuring them to get the most effect out of the smallest amount of stuff because you can overwhelm someone if you give them too many things. Mm -hmm. If you've just tuned in, we're speaking to Harry Krasakis on One World Music. Harry Krasakis is a medical herbalist, and he's talking about adaptogens. Okay, so I, I'd like to go into a couple of the herbs, uh, just to give you an idea of kind of how cool they really are, uh, and the ones that I use, too, because I don't use all 30 or so of these adaptogens that occur worldwide. I may use about 10 of them, but I use about five or six of them regularly. I use a lot of reishi mushroom, American ginseng, Siberian ginseng, holy basil, cisandra, and ashwagandha. And the reason why I use those six primarily um, is because they're calming. Uh, a number of adaptogens can be quite anabolic, which is very good but uh, a little more limited in its application. So when I get people that have been really run down by uh, long-term stress in their life and or disease, that's where the anabolic, the, the more anabolic type adaptogens come in. Things like the red ginsengs, cordyceps, rapunthicum, mumi. They tend to push harder on the body. Uh, but again, when I'm dealing often, <coughs> Americans tend to be overamped to start off with. So I try to calm them down, at the same time keep them focused, which is an interesting challenge. Because um, a lot of times I get people that come in that just want to be able to have more output in their body. They're not sick, but they want to be able to get more things done. And those kind of folks, you generally, you want to calm them down, get them more focused, strengthen their nervous system. The combination of adaptogens, nervines, and nootropics really, really help them. So anyway, once again, the, the adaptogens form a core therapy in the, in, in the way I approach things. So reishi mushroom. Um, we tend to think of the most studied herb or most revered herb in the East as ginseng. But really, it's reishi mushroom. It's got a longer history, and it's got more research done on it by the Asians. Basically, there are two types, a red and a black. Now, I mean, if you do the research, the aficionados say there's about six different variations in there, but I 
I don't see it, and I just apply the red and black indiscriminately in the same way. Um, one of the problems with herbs uh, in general is quality. Uh, you can buy reishi mushroom for $6 a pound, and you can buy it for $160 a pound. Um, that's as a raw product. Uh, I rarely use raw herb. Once in a while, somebody wants that kind of thing. I rarely use an independent herb also. I usually use them in formula. So anyway, if I do buy bulk, of course, I buy better quality. But again, uh, people are not very compliant in terms of making teas, especially with something like reishi, because if you're going to cook the mushroom, it takes about an hour and a half, and you usually have to do two cookings. So it's a lot of work. It tends to be a bit smelly in your house, and they're bitter. The herbs taste bitter, so we're not really tuned into that. So a lot of the stuff I use is in capsuled or tinctured forms. But once again, they're either standardized and or concentrated ratios. So for something like reishi, you can buy reishi mushroom in a capsule that's ground up reishi mushroom. It could even be micronized into a very fine powder. That's it. And if you take that product, you will not digest that product. You can't. It's, a reishi contains a substance called chitin, which is really kind of wood-like, cardboard-like. You just will not break it down. So it has to be conditioned in some way. As I said, many of the things are water-soluble, so you can make a tea. Or you can buy it from a company who does dual extraction methodology of water and ethanol. That's, that's what I use. And it's usually standardized to a 14% polysaccharide, 6% triterpenes. And that, those two markers are the two most studied markers in reishi mushroom. And in a general way, the polysaccharides give you the immunological effect and the triterpenes give you the, the vascular effect, cardiovascular effect, because reishi is an excellent um, immune tonic. It is a total immune enhancer. It is also an excellent vascular tonic. Um, it will lower hypertension. It's an excellent treatment for angina. It's an excellent treatment for hypercholesterolemia, having high cholesterol. Um, it is, as, as I mentioned before, it is also antioxidant and anti-inflammatory. And what I meant by it being a total immune enhancement is from the front to the back, from your macrophages, which are kind of your front grunt attack cells in your immune system that set up a number of other immunological reactions, to your final net against cancer cells and virally infected cells, which are your natural killer cells. Um, reishi enhances everything in between, including those two areas. So the strength and production of the, the, the type of cells, the communication between the cells, the attack information for the cells, the ability of the cells to mature properly through collecting a certain amount of proteins. So all that is enhanced and balanced by the reishi. And once again, once the stressor has been neutralized, the body has to come back again to a, to a parasympathetic state. Otherwise, this long-term stress destroys us. And once again, the adaptogens help prevent that from happening. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, reishi uh, will boost uh, bone marrow. It actually creates more of it. So it's excellent for the production of red and white blood cells, which again is a big deal when you're treating someone who's going through chemo or radiation, or once again has been under long-term duress and they've been depleted. So when I'm working with people that have chemo and radiation, parts of their protocol always contain reishi mushroom because of that effect. I combine it with other things as well. Um, one of the herbs I'm gonna try and go over to is ashwagandha, mm -hmm. which I use a lot as well, which again has a really strong effect on both white and red blood cell count. And this is a big deal in terms of cancer treatment because if they drop too low, the docs start worrying of opportunistic infection is gonna kill the client. So they stop treatment, which for the cancer's sake is a real positive thing because now the cancer has the ability to begin to develop a pump to develop to become resistant to the chemotherapeutic drugs. So stopping therapy in the middle of the therapy is a bad idea for that reason. So my job when they're going through that and they choose to go through that is to make sure they can go from the beginning to the end and get maximum effect from both the chemo and the radiation. And I'm trying to protect them as well because the herbs also protect normal cells and weaken weaken, not strengthen, but weaken the cancer cells. 
Anything that can begin to normalize a cancer cell has begun to undermine it from the inside out, and anything that normalizes the surrounding environment has begun to degrade it by taking away things like growth factors and signals that it needs to continue its, its kind of dirty work. Mm -hmm. We're going to take a little break. We're speaking with Harry Krasakis, a medical herbalist. androgens into estrogen because that's the driving force in the cancer. So if you implement these ar anti-aromatase agents, aromatase is the enzyme that converts that. So they inhibit that enzyme and reishi is one of the things that works tremendously on that. As I mentioned before, it's a great treatment for bronchitis, usually in its more in the chronic uh, phases of it. And it's a specific treatment for altitude sickness um, which means you have to take it about two weeks in advance if you're going to do a climb, heavy climb. Um, we used to use it in Colorado when we go above 10,000 feet. It works. It's also a mood enhancing agent. It has actually creates a kind of slightly positive feeling in you, even though the outside world hasn't changed any. You kind of your ability to deal with it is uh, a little better. Um, it is anti-allergenic, and you can use that directly when you're having an allergy attack, uh, or to, to tone down allergic type responses that people have on a chronic level. Um, it has a positive effect in relationship to the drug Herceptin, which is used for breast cancer. It also has a general anabolic effect on the body, and basically all the things that drag us down, long-term disease and or stress and age in general, have a catabolic effect to where we begin to lose muscle mass and bone mass. The adaptogens and Rishi specifically reduce that, bring it down tremendously, and keep us strong. It's a good quality antiviral. Uh, traditionally, it's used in China for both hepatitis B and C. And it helps reduce resistance both to chemo and radiation. It's a pretty impressive list. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the next herb I'd like to talk about, what I, which I use a lot of, is ashwagandha. And this is from the Ayurvedic tradition from India. Uh, ashwagandha, like what we think of ginseng in China, ashwagandha is to India. It's kind of the top of the top. It's a root, right? Yes, it's a root. It's a root mm -hmm. But uh, you can use leaf and berry for things too, but the, it's the root that has the adaptogenic qualities in it. And again, it's kind of calming. Um, it has excellent anti-stress uh, properties, specifically um, on cortisol response. I use it a lot with magnolia bark, and I use it at night before people go to bed. It's an interesting tonic because it actually tones things while you can be asleep, um, which, you, again, you don't find that in a lot of the tonics. It, as well as many of the adaptogens, is an excellent fertility agent. They would also function as aphrodisiacs, but not the kind of aphrodisiacs we may be taught to think about. They're not irritants. They actually kind of strengthen the, end, the endocrine system. So they, they create strength in the organs. Uh, ashwagandha is an excellent treatment for anemia because it's high in iron. If you cook it with milk and molasses, it's kind of the traditional method of approach. And as I mentioned before, it's an excellent, excellent vascular tonic. Low is cholesterol, LDL, low is VLDL, low is triglycerides, and will normalize blood sugars as well. And again, it will increase red and white red blood cell count. So again, I use it with chemo and or radiation. And I, once again, I use a number of these herbs if people have to go through surgery, before and after surgery as well, to bring downtime down. It is to bring recovery time up and bring the, get them up quicker. And also, with, when people have cancer and they're getting surgeries, you're increasing inflammation. So one of the primary things you want to do is bring inflammation down quickly as well as strengthen the body, and the adaptogens do both. Um, a number of the adaptogens kind of have personalities, and the personality of ashwagandha is that it likes the brain. It likes to do things on the brain in a very positive way. So I use it in all kinds of brain injuries, and I mean things like uh, depression, uh, ADDH, um, premature dementia, Alzheimer's. I mean, I use it in conjunction with other things like go to cola or acetyl L carnitine because I also use supplements in my practice as well. But I use a lot of ashwagandha and I use it in a lot of settings. Um, 
The thing about ashwagandha, too, for those who have gardens, is it's easy to grow. And it's a one-year plant. Whereas the ginsengs, man, they take you know, five, seven years to come to maturity. These things you can harvest every year, and they produce good quality. I've grown maybe five, ten pounds of it to know. You can produce good tinctures and good caps if you like powdering things down, and good teas. And once again, uh, a good ashwagandha is going to be bitter. Most of the stuff I've seen commercially in terms of bulk uh, is not very good. And that's true for a number of herbs. Um, ashwagandha, I, I don't see a lot of good quality. You probably can go on the internet and buy from a very specific company, but uh, the stuff I've seen wasn't very promising. So grow your own. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I could talk more and more if you wanted me to, but I, I think I'm going to end. Are you? I hope I, hope I, gave, <laughs> hope I gave enough information. There. Okay, well... How about just going over those last three? I know holy basil is Tulsi tea. Yes. And that's available in the health food stores. And also that's another herb that real easy to grow uh -huh. is, is uh, holy basil. And it smells great. I don't think there's one plant that smells like you just want to go eat it. It's holy basil. <laughs> it smells like candy. Uh-huh. And it works great, too. It's and got it's a lot of good background. And it's widely used, right, in India yeah, and, as well. And again, it's mm -hmm. calming, which, again, I like as a criteria for treating Americans. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Because <laughs> they need to be calmed down uh -huh, a little bit. Uh -huh. And you already did cover the Siberian ginseng and the Panax, so yeah. Yeah, um, I mean, I can go over American ginseng, which I use a lot of as well. I mean, again, American ginseng was discovered in the early to mid-1700s. And when it was, and the Chinese got wind of it, we wound up shipping out so much of them that we depleted our, our own indigenous crops. So now it's a, th it's a threatened plant. But um, the Asians like it because it tends to be more calming than the, their varieties of Panax. We have a quinquifolum, and it has somewhat different qualities. It's a little more yin, it's a little more moistening, it's a little more calming, actually a lot more than, say, uh, a Korean red ginseng. But again, I use it in a lot of the similar settings. Uh, if you go into a Chinese herb shop, you will see... I mean, if it's a decent quality shop, you'll see 20 or 30 different kinds of American ginseng ranging anywhere from $100 a pound to $700 a pound. And they actually look very similar. But the way you can tell the difference is if you take one of those $100 pound roots and one of those $700 pound roots, and the same size er root will have much greater density in the uh, expensive roots. You can feel it in the weight. They're older, usually, too. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what's given them more growth time. Well, could I just ask a, an overall question? If somebody, to the listeners, if they wanted to do something on a more daily basis, would that be the Rishi mushroom? Sure. Mm -hmm. any, actually, any of those that I mentioned would be okay to use mm -hmm. as singular herbs because mm -hmm. uh, they have a nice effect. Mm -hmm. um, they'll only help you. Mm -hmm. I mean, and again, you're going to have to, ju I, this is what I tell my clients all the time. You cannot know how everybody is going to respond mm -hmm. to things, no matter how much knowledge you have. So I always tell them, look, here's the formula. I want you to pay attention after you take it. If there's going to be a problem, you're going to notice it in about 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. And it would usually be something minor, which again, once they stop, it stops. So that's the same advice I would give to anybody. Mm -hmm. If you want to try something, go ahead. Make sure the quality is there. Make sure you're taking enough and often enough. These are problems that clients generally have. And when people get a bit discouraged, they say it didn't work. Well, it's usually those three, one of those three problems or all three. Quality, frequency of dose, and amount uh -huh. when you dose people. It is hard to take, take it three days, three times a day. <laughs> yeah, I mean, most people, uh, mostly it becomes a logistical problem. Yeah. I have to wind up just talking about how they can carry pill cases or maybe I give them extra bottles to use for tinctures mm -hmm. that they can just carry with them and make it convenient. But you can do it. It's not really that hard. Mm -hmm. If you're um, going to drink water, put you it can, in your water. Yeah, you can. Mm -hmm. It's really not complicated. You just have to <laughs> think it out. Yeah. Which mo And sometimes you have to help people do that. Mm-hmm. Um, can anyone be allergic to any of these adaptogens? So, I, I have never had an allergic reaction from anyone, but mm -hmm. I can't see why if someone is allergic to mushrooms that mm -hmm. adaptogenic mushroom, which Rishi is, mm -hmm. might have an effect. Because there's quite a few adaptogenic mushrooms mm -hmm. um, that I use. But yeah, it's possible uh -huh. that in plants in general. I mean, you, can find, you find people allergic to echinacea occasionally mm -hmm. to chamomile, that kind of stuff because they're, they respond to that kind of a flower. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
but it's not very often. Yeah. I mean, so, I think Harry, do you have any local presentations planned? I do. I, I speak at the uh, Butte County Library twice a month here in Chico. I have an office here in Chico, too, on Manzanita Court. Um, I speak twice a month. It's usually announced on the radio, on e posts, and in the paper. And also, I, I speak once a month up in Red Bluff, where I also have an office. Mm -hmm. And also in my hometown, which is Dobbins slash Oregon House area, where I give lectures as well. And I have an office there as well. Mm -hmm. So, um, also, the website is herbalistandherbs.com, and there's lots of information there. There's nothing for sale. <laughs> <laughs> except me um, and there's just a lot of good articles and some videos on there and it's all original material so you can walk away with lots of good stuff for nothing mm -hmm. and uh, I welcome you to take a look there yeah and um, I'd like to have you come back maybe seasonally maybe sure. talk about the spring season or sure, it'd be summer, fun. fall I mean, yeah. for people that like to talk this is the perfect environment uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> so. and there's a lot to learn about herbs Yes. Great. It was well, great to be here. Thank you so much. And Thanks again, can you give your um, your website? Sure. Herbalistandherbs.com. Okay, great. That's Harry Krasakis of Herbalist and Herbs. Thank you so much. Thank you.